Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. There are some weeks where I want to record and make a video about everything I do in here, and there are other weeks where I just want to get the job done so I can go home at the end of the day. This week's the latter. Let's do something straightforward today. Um, I've got a HP AIO that needs a uh, SSD put in it. Let's get into it. So to approach all-in-one computers like this, there are a couple of ways that you're commonly going to get them apart. Um, you will need to find screws, basically. Um, and some of them, the screws are fairly obvious. Sometimes they're really hard to find. So um, a lot of these that you will see will be HP um, or, uh, well, a lot of the AOs are HPs, actually, certainly in this country. Um, I think Acer have got a couple. I think Lenovo have a couple as well. Um, so sometimes you will have an access panel on the back uh, or a panel that will clearly come off somehow. Um, some of them are generous enough that there's literally just a screw panel on the back that you can see and it will just start revealing stuff. With this one we've got a solid white panel with no gaps in it at all. So clearly nothing is coming off of the back of this. So the next place I would be looking is underneath. So if we have a look on the underside of this guy, um, we've got this cover here. Um, but there's no screws or anything like that. If we saw some screws here, we might be able to take those off and start prying the back cover off, but no sign of that. Let's have a quick look under here and see if we can spot anything. So I'll just try and pry away at this. I think this is only going to get us to the stand, which sometimes will help you, but not always. So I'm just gonna dig under there, pop that guy out. Uh, oh, that didn't help me. There we go. Right, and peering under there, that doesn't reveal anything to me at all. There's just more of the stand there, so this doesn't help me at all. So we're not going in from the back or on the bottom, so that leaves the front. So for the front, we've got the panel, and I've seen some where you have to literally pry the panel out without breaking it, which was good fun. Um, and then we've got this chin bar along the bottom, and that is a separate bit of plastic. So I think this guy, yeah, this guy's gonna come off. I'm gonna just see if I can pull at it. Not getting any luck there. Let's try prying at it. Uh -huh. I'm making progress here. So I'm digging in under and then pulling the, and then pulling, I'm going in um, under the strip and then prying upwards to push the plastic bar away from the surround and that will defeat the clips. Let's go along the bottom until we've popped all of those clips. And let's try, there we go. Aha. Right, chin bar removed. Now we're getting somewhere. So that's revealed the speakers. There's a lot of screws here. So now the question is which ones need to come out. Um, there is a big central screw here, which looks like it might be holding the screen in. Um, I think we're probably going to have to take out more than these, but I'm going to start with that big one in the middle and just see if that lets me pull the screen out. Right, that's done. Let's just see if this guy's going to lift. Ooh. It's hard to tell, it's quite heavy. I'm actually just gonna put this upright and just see if it'll tilt out. No, nope, that doesn't feel promising. It's always difficult to tell whether something is held in or whether it's just, um, just compression fit. That doesn't feel good. Let's take some more screws out and see where that gets me. So I'm gonna go for the screws that have arrows pointing at them, 
which is quite a lot of them actually, and I think that's going to take out this plastic surround and possibly the speaker, no, not the speakers, just the plastic chin bar. Let's see if that gives me more access. Yeah, it just needs a little bit of prying at the side, but my God, I've got to be careful right now. Because when you're prying directly down the side of a bare LCD like this, one slip and that LCD is done. Oof. Put a big old spudger underneath that, just to support my progress. Oh, that doesn't feel good. Not sure what's holding me up at the moment. I'm going to get another scraper. Oh, you know what? I was wrong. We're not separating from the plastic. This whole shooting match is going to lift. There it goes. Okay, it's just holding in at the top now. Oh. Ooh, easy, slow, slow, slow. There's no clips up there. Maybe we've just got to do an even lift. Hmm. Yeah, okay, there we go. Now the top's come out. There we go, that's now loose. So, I'm gonna have lift up and have a look. Right, yeah, we've got a nice big wire holding this in now. So I'm gonna get my hands underneath that and just lift that up. Up we go, all the way up. There we go. And as you can see, we've got this nice, huge, long display cable. That's actually not bad. That's very good for disassembly. So I can now just unlock and disconnect that. And we've got backlight power. There we go. Whew. All right, that's fine. We were going in a bit vicious underneath there, but thankfully no harm, no foul. Um, because we had metal at the bottom, that's why I was actually brave enough to do that. If there would not been metal there, I would not have been prying there. Right, there's our hard drive. And we've got a screw there. And there. There we go. And there's our hard drive. Can we disconnect that? More judicious prying. Out, there we go, right. One hard drive. So that's a one terabyte, three and a half inch hard drive. Nothing super flash. We can just take the four screws out the sides and now we can move to backing up and imaging. So this rig over here is where I do my hard drive backing up and stuff like this. So um, this computer has a bunch of high cap hard drives in it. Well, four terabyte hard drives, not a lot by these days, but still. Um, so it's got enough storage that I can just dump backups of laptops and customer rigs onto this and retain them for a period of time, um, depending on the customer and the job and stuff like that. Um, we've got a hard drive dock here, which I shall now drop this hard drive into. So pop that in there and off we go. Um, I can also connect it up with a SATA cable if I pull out a SATA cable, but USB docks are just easier. Um, and then if I'm dealing with um, M.2 drives, I've got a couple of methods for that. I've got a PCI Express adapter, so I can stick the NVMe drive in that, slot that into the computer, um, or uh, SATA-based M.2s, I've got a USB adapter for that there. 
Uh, and then finally, um, I've also got, and I'm working on a review for this guy, this is an Acasis NVMe M.2 um, dock, and that is 10 gig um, USB type C. Um, so that gives pretty decent performance for NVMe drives as well. Um, so video for that is in the works. Um, however, today we've got just a bog standard hard drive, so we'll just lob that in there. This dock will take two and a half and three and a half inch drives as an FYI. So, uh, right, so that is mounted. And now what I'm gonna do, the first thing I'm gonna do is just take a full backup of the drive so we have the customer's data secured. So um, I'm gonna use Drive Snapshot for this. So I've done videos about Drive Snapshot in the past, never full comprehensive ones because Drive Snapshot, there's enough quirfuls with this app that I couldn't tell you that it's an efficient way to duplicate drives. Um, like there's loads of people who will already be rushing to the comments to go, why aren't you using DD? Why aren't you using... Um, Clonezilla, why aren't you using Acronis or the God knows how many other apps there are that do this. Uh, I use Snapshot because I know it like the back of my hand, basically. Um, you can get a free 30-day trial for this if you want to give it a whirl, but one of my favorite features and why I keep using it is that A, it's very, very tolerant of bad sectors in drives. Uh, I've seen Snapshot pull out working images from drives that are in really bad shape. It might take it a couple of days to do the backup, but it will just soldier on through that drive no matter how many bad sectors it comes across. So um, it's very good for that. Uh, it also, it doesn't do a direct disk to disk. Um, and that is, again, to a certain extent, it's a longer way, it's, it would be much faster to go disk to disk. But because I'm going to back up to one of my drives with an image, in the interim, I have a backup along the way. So that's just good practice anyway. I don't like doing disk to disk imaging unless the data is not important. Because um, yeah, obviously if something goes wrong with a disk to disk image, then you're increasing the risk of losing the source data. So anyway, the first thing I'm gonna do with this is we're just gonna take a full backup of it. So I'm gonna backup disk to file and I'm gonna grab all the partitions on here. and I'm just gonna drop these onto my backups drive. Start copy. There we go, that's fumbled through the initial system partitions a little bit now, and now it's onto the main partition where you'll actually see it ramping up to speed. Right, our image is complete, so okay to that. So we now have a full backup of the hard drive that we're going to image. Uh, so the SSD I'm fitting in is gonna be this Crucial MX, ah, this Crucial MX 500, and we're putting in a 500 gigabyte drive. Um, so uh, this, this hard drive has, how many gigs of data is that? It has 137 gigs of data on it. So that fits into a 500 quite nicely. Now what this does mean is that we are going to image onto a smaller drive than the source. Um, and this introduces catches and specifically, it introduces one of the main issues why I, it's difficult to recommend uh, Snapshot as a recommended imaging program because it doesn't handle big to small uh, imaging very well. Um, what happens when with a hard drive like this, although there's 137 gigs of data on it, that data is actually gonna be spread out across the drive. We can actually visualize this with a defragger. If I open up a hard drive defragger, um, then we can have a look and we can see how the data is spread out. Now this drive is actually not bad. It's, um, the fragmentation is bad. There's a lot of red appearing here, but the furthest point of data is only this far down. Sometimes with hard drives, you will find that there is data all the way down here. Um, because the drive is not necessarily storing the data neatly packed up in the top left. Uh, you will often have data that's just all over the drive. And when you're doing a bit-for-bit -bit backup of a drive, um, you are copying not only the data, but the position of the data as well. And that means that if you try and restore the drive to a, sm if you try and restore your image to a smaller drive, even though there is only say 130 gigs of data here, if a bunch of that data is out at like the 700 gigabyte mark, 
then the image won't fit because it can't put it in the same relative location. And that is a problem that drives snapshot encounters. Now, most other drive imaging tools like your Acronis um, or uh, whatever uh, will usually account for this and they will shuffle the data into place. Drive Snapshot doesn't do this, and that is the big drawback of Snapshot. So we will need to do a little bit of prep work to make sure that we can still restore to a smaller drive. So I'll show you the tricks I do for that. I don't actually think we're going to need any of that for this drive because it's all up the top of the drive. But I'll show you what I would do to approach that anyway, just for good measure. So uh, let's close this. For the record, the fragmentation of the drive is completely irrelevant to us because we're moving on to an SSD anyway. And on an SSD, fragmentation doesn't matter. So if I wanted to image this onto a smaller drive and it wouldn't fit, we need to reduce the partition size. So one way that we can start approaching this is to open up disk management. If I right click on the start menu and go to disk management, we can look at the drive and we can right click on it and try to shrink the volume. Now, before we, before we go any further, um, I'm going to point out a couple of things. I'm working on the customer's original drive here. If the drive was failing, then um, I would probably not want to be working on it. And also keep in mind, I have a backup of this drive, so I can restore it if everything goes sideways. There are some people who would say, no, you shouldn't touch the original drive. You should restore this to another drive and then work on that one. I think there are levels of care that need to be taken. Um, I have a trusted backup here, so I'm not super fussed about that. If it's a problem to you, you could restore it to another drive and work there. Anyway, moving on. So let's try and shrink this volume. And Windows will now have a look and it will see how much it can reduce the volume size by. And look at that, we do actually have a problem here. Uh, I was expecting to be able to see something like this on the defrag, but for some reason or other we couldn't. Maybe there just wasn't enough data there to cause an issue. However, it's only allowing me to lower the partition size to 781 gigabytes, which ain't going to fit on my 500 gig SSD. Um, so, and we can confirm this in Snapshot. If I try and restore the disk, let's just select our Windows partition. Interesting. We're getting very, very mixed, res very, very mixed results here, which is not great for a video. This is why it's very difficult to make a video about Snapshot because there's so many ifs, ands, and buts regarding it. But Snapshot tells me I need 286 gigabytes to restore. So that's still a lot bigger than the volume of data, but it's also a lot less than what Windows is telling me. Um, so you see why this can cause a problem and why Snapshot at face value can look really good, but when you're trying to go from big to small, you can get a whole you get a whole rabbit hole of issues. However, we'll continue. So, uh, let's say we want to go lower than this. Let's say that we want to get this down to a 204, 240 gigabytes for a 250 gig SSD or something like that. How do we get lower? So, so we need to reduce this down further. So the the big main things that usually put data out in the middle of the drive that Windows is unable to move is the page file also known as virtual memory, the hibernation file, and restore points. So what we need to do is eliminate all of those three, and we'll probably find we can reduce this file size significantly. So let's do that. So firstly, if I go into the hard drive itself and we view hidden files, because this is not a live drive, I can just go in and just sledgehammer nuke the hyper file, the page file, and the swap file. Again, friendly reminder, we have a backup of all of this, so I can go in guns blazing here. So I'm just going to shred those. And so now what I want to do is delete system restore points. So to do that, we're going to open up a um, command prompt, and I'm going to type in VSS admin. That's volume shadow service, I think it is, admin. And the volume shadow service, or shadow copy, is the system restore service, effectively. So VSS admin, and we're going to delete shadows, uh, then sl slash four equals H colon. So that means we're going to delete all shadow copies for H drive. Enter, and it will say, yes, there is one restore point. So yep, I'm going to delete that. 
Done and done. Exit out of that. And now if we come back to this and try and shrink it again, wait for it to count up the volume. And now as you can see, we've gone all the way down to 126 gigabytes. So that's, that's a lot lower than we were before. Now when I'm manually shrinking volumes like this, I never go as low as I possibly can because it requires Windows to crush all of the data into that minimum space. And what that does is it fragments the data more, but the bigger issue is that it takes significantly longer. So in this instance, we only need to fit into a 500 gig partition. So I'm actually just going to change that to about, uh, I'm just gonna drop that into 500,000 megabytes. And, you know, for good measure, let's make that 600,000. So we're now dropping down to 353 gigabytes in size. Now, that looks like, that looks fairly arbitrary, but basically I want to be well small enough that it will fit on the destination drive, but I don't want to go so small that Windows now has to move a crap ton of data around in order to cram it into the minimum size. So if you do it this way, it's significantly faster to do this bit here. Now it's just going to sit on that spinner while it sho shoves all the data around. And if we try to go down to the minimum size, it will take ages, but as you can see, it's already done it in the time that it's taken me to explain this. So yeah, if you try and go down to minimum size, that could take 10 or 15 minutes, which is not a long time, but it means you've got to walk away and do something else. So whatever. Right, so now we've shrunk this, what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna snapshot it again. So back up disk to file. We're gonna run our backup again. I don't care about the restore partition. No one cares about the restore partition. And I'm gonna put that in as HP AIO shrink. And I'm gonna run the backup again. And now I will have a smaller version of the backup, which I can then restore directly to the SSD. So again, this look, this, if this looks convoluted, that's because it is. And this is why whenever someone says, what program do you use to image drives? I go, um, so yeah, I can't say that I recommend this method, but again, the reason why I use Snapshot is because I know the ins and outs of it. I know it like the back of my hand. And when you're dealing with broken drives, you have lots and lots and lots of very powerful options and tricks that you can do with Snapshot that other, drive, other imaging programs with their fancy GUIs don't allow you to do. Um, so if you're just trying to image your clunky old hard drive onto your shiny new SSD that you've bought, this method probably isn't for you. Um, you should just go and use one of the many other programs that are out there. But if you're running a repair shop and you want a, uh, an imaging tool that gives you lots and lots of fine-tuned controls for trying to recover a drive in Windows without delving into the world of Linux and DD Rescue and stuff like that, then Snapshot is your best friend. So that's that. We'll leave this to run, then we'll start restoring. Now we're done with this, I shall eject the drive. So we'll eject the customer drive, pop that out, put in our SSD. And now I'm gonna restore a complete disk from images. And I always use restore complete disk because that ensures that Snapshot will set up the drive with the correct partition structure and it will convert it to GPT if necessary, and so on and so forth. It just does everything for me. Uh, so let's make sure, let's select AIO shirk because I can't spell shrink. There we go. And we're only gonna grab the first three partitions because I don't care about the, the restore partition on the end. If you really want to, you can manually create that, but yeah, don't care. We're gonna select our empty uh, MX500 here. And I don't need to do any prep work with this drive. It's fresh out the box. I don't even need to initialize it. Snapshot will do all of that for me. Just hit next. So uh, this will overwrite all data. So now Snapshot is going, or Windows is going to spit out a bunch of error messages because Snapshot will create the partition structure and Windows will be like, oh, there's a load of unformatted partitions that have suddenly been connected. So as you see, it's now going to complain. So. Yes, we're going down to a smaller drive, that's fine. So unformatted disk, yep, yep. Cool, that's fine, off it goes. 
Right, this looks done because it's popped up with the drive again. So there we go, 100% complete, okay. So there's a little bit of tidying up that I wanna do now is I want to make sure that we're using the entire drive. So I'm gonna reopen disk management. And what we'll see here is we've got some unallocated space because I reduced the partition size down. Um, so, of course, you could reduce the partition size down to exactly the size you need. However, in my experience, what size the drive says it is, what it's supposed to be, and what Windows says it is, are all completely different numbers. So my methodology is always to go well under what you think you need, give yourself like 10 or 20 gigs of headspace, so you end up with this situation, and then we can just do right-click, extend volume, and we can just extend it through across that unallocated space. By default, it will put in the maximum amount that it can. Finish, and there we go. And as you can see, we've ended up with a 465.49 gigabytes, but good luck actually calculating that number in any sane way. Um, it probably can be done, but it's a lot easier just to go well below and then expand across the unallocated space again. Right, so now we have all of the customer data imaged onto the SSD. I'm going to put the SSD back in the computer. So to mount my SSD in the original 3.5 inch cage, I'm going to use this adapter plate. Um, I like these metal ones um, because they don't feel horrible and cheap and plastic like the cheap plastic ones. Um, so four screws on the bottom, bolt that in there, and then we can put this in here. So a couple of things that we do need to watch out for when using an adapter plate like these is they're often shorter than the original drive was, and that can give you problems with cable reach. Uh, so let's see, the cable goes in up there. So let's just quickly mount this up and we can just see if that's, actually I think this might be a problem. Uh, let's start seeing how this is gonna pan out. Right, so if we place this in the drive to the point where the screw holes actually live up, line up, it lands there, and our cable is coming into there. So that's going to be a bit of a problem, really. Um, I have other options. We could just double-sided tape it down there. Uh, and for this use case, that's becoming increasingly attractive. I'm going to see if I can ghetto screw it. Um, I will use double-sided tape if I have to. Because sometimes, unless you take a Dremel to this and do uh, modifications to it, um, you don't have any other choice. Especially because sometimes the SATA cable coming in, our one has got a bit of flex on it, but sometimes the SATA cable will only go to that specific point and it won't reach anywhere else. So, like where this plate centralizes the drive, even if it was up to there, the cable won't go that much further, for example. So. Um, sometimes just literally double-sided taping down in the corner like that is a completely valid option. And when I see people who have done that, I don't hate them. Um, but the problem is, is at some point that adhesive might fail. Uh, now I've got some really strong adhesive that I would trust. I've got Tessa tape. So I'm thinking I'm going to Tessa tape this in. Another option would be if we move this around a little bit, we can get one of the screw holes visible there. So we could stick a screw in there and that hard mounts it down, but we've only got one screw hole. If this honeycomb structure extended just a bit further and we could get two screw holes visible at the same time, I would trust that, but we've got to move too far back for that. So I'm going to test the tape this in. It's not my first choice. I would much rather have been able to put in an adapter plate and screw it in there. However, the only other way we're going to do this is if we Dremel off this back plate. Um, and I don't really want to do that. I mean, we could. No, that's a lot of work. I'm going to Tessa tape it in. The great thing about SSDs is because there's no moving parts, it's not, you know, if we think about the worst case scenario and the tape fails and the drive is hanging off, the drive doesn't weigh anything and it has no moving parts, so that actually doesn't matter at all. It's, um, yeah, like I prefer it didn't, but I've done this many times in the past when needs be. 
The only other disadvantage of it as well, of course, is um, this is a pain in the ass if someone wants to remove the drive to change it or do maintenance later on. Once I've tested taped this in, it's going to require detaping to get it out. So I'm not a fan of this method. However, there's no other choice here, I don't think. The other, the, another option might be, which I'm not going to do now, but if you really, really wanted to, I've seen some um, two and a half to three and a half inch adapters which uh, specifically orient the two and a half inch drive into the corner. So it's an adapter block that fits in there and the mounts for the drive are specifically in the corner for this exact reason to, to deal with this scenario. Um, however, they're not the ones that I keep in stock and I'm not ordering in a specialist one just for oddball computers like this. I'm just going to test the tape it down instead. So as you can see with the cable here, we do have a little bit of cable length to be able to move around here. However, because of the way this block works, we can't thread cables through. And because it's a specialized connector, we can't run a longer cable either which is a bit of a shame. We do have a standard SASA connector there, but the power creates a problem. So, you know, again, if one was so inclined, you can make some custom cables, but you, you have to start asking yourself, how much trouble are we going through for this? There we go, that plugs in there, and that one out, slot in. There we go. That's not going anywhere. Put our electromagnetic shield across again. There we go. Right, that's that. Um, any dust of note? Doesn't look that way. Um, these AIOs, they tend to have reasonably good cooling in them because they often have very low power CPUs in there because they're cheap. It's mostly laptop spec stuff in here. So this massive heat sink and fan easily keeps it cool. So there's usually not too much of an issue with dust ingress um, purely because they don't put out that much heat. The bad side of that is that the hard drives in these things basically have zero ventilation at all. And hard drives don't produce a lot of heat. And generally speaking, three and a half inch hard drives, in my experience, are extremely reliable. Um, however, in all-in-ones like this, they tend to have a high failure rate because there's just there's, there's nowhere for the heat to go. And even though hard drives don't generate a great deal of heat, with absolutely zero airflow around them, I mean, all it has is the slight residual air of just um, this guy is pulling in some air from just around the computer. And like, I don't even think this is properly ducted. There's, there's a little bit of venting at the bottom. So I guess it's kind of pulling up some air along the back, which goes across and into there, and then tries to blow out the top, but that's also going to blow around in here as well. You know, heat soak will get it eventually. And so that's why these AIOs tend to have a high failure rate on their hard drives, even though three and a half inch hard drives are generally pretty reliable. But yeah, anyway, there's not a lot of dust here. So there's no, there's nothing else that I really care about doing. Um, there's going to be memory under there. If you wanted to upgrade the memory, now's a good time to do it. Um, that's not part of this one. For good measure, I'll check the uh, the CMOS battery again while I'm here because it's a pain in the ass to get to it. So we'll just make sure that it's not bad. So I'll set my multimeter to voltage mode. Black probe on a screw hole. 3.21, very healthy. We're looking for 3.1 minimum. If it's below 3.1 in circuit, you should probably change it. All right, so we'll offer this up. Just balance it in place. And we've got to connect a backlight cable and our display cable. Once again, like actual kudos to HP for putting this nice long foldy cable on here. Um, that's actually very uncommon for all-in-ones or laptops to have nice long cables that allow you to properly pull up the screen. Uh, normally, I'd expect this cable to be half the length and I'd have to have the, the screen at a weird angle and thread my hand underneath it and stuff like that. It'd be horrifying. So those are now connected. I'm going to drop that in at the top and rest that in there. And that's gone mostly down. So 
I'm just going to go around the edges. I can't press very hard on the front of this. Hmm. I'm just going to very gingerly go around, see if I can... There's a, there we go, I'm getting some clicks and some clonks. There we go. Yeah, that's enough for me. And the screen is now recessed by about a millimetre all the way around. Oh, that side's a bit high still. There we go, a couple more clicks out of that side. Yeah, I'm confident that that's in. Uh, realistically, I should switch it on at this point. In fact, I should have switched it in before I pressed that into place and just made sure that it booted up before I committed. Uh, but for the sake of the video, I'm going to be a hero and go no guts, no glory. Uh, don't do that. Test it before you actually click it all down into place. Right, let's find out if I've made terrible choices or not. Power on. Got a power light. And we've got a HP logo. And the password I have from the customer doesn't work. So that's the end of this session for now because it's too late in the day to get that. Um, however, at this point now we're into servicing land. Um, we have already made sure that the drive partitions look correct. The machine starts up. All I've got left to do now is just to make sure that Windows updates are installed, make sure it's on the latest build update, check for any screamingly obvious issues, but past that, a modern Windows computer with an SSD, there's not a lot of maintenance it actually needs. Um, with, a, with an SSD in there now, it's going to be so quick that you basically just brute force through everything. So that's where I'm going to finish up for today. So I hope that was useful and gives you a rough idea on how to approach um, all-in-one computers for SSD conversions. Um, this one was probably... It's not the scariest one I've ever done, but it does show that sometimes you need to be a bit careful going around the edges of LCDs. Um, I've had customers come in who've tried to do this themselves and cracked the screen. And once you do that, trying to find a replacement screen for one of these guys, not fun. Not fun at all. Uh, it will be expensive, I can tell you that much. Anyway, uh, I hope that was useful. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.